Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to take a look at the situation with air pollution and how severe it is and also what are some of the negative impacts on adults but especially children. And my guest today is an expert who just authored a report. My guest today is Mr. Nicholas Reese. Nick Reese is a policy specialist on climate and economic analyst analysis at UNICEF, the UN Children's Fund. Mr. Reese authored a recent report called Clear the Air for Children and he was kind enough to bring a copy today and this is literally hot off the press. It has not even been stapled or bound and we're delighted that we're going to be able to focus on this very important topic because it does, it impacts people all around the world, not just people in one or two or three cities. So Nick Reese, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you. I appreciate you being with me. This is still hot. <laughs> like I said, it's hot <laughs> off the press, which is very good. Let's talk about, uh, first off, before we get into this, let's talk about UNICEF, the UN Children's Fund, which is probably, along with UN Peacekeepers, probably the best known entity within the United Nations. Most of our viewers have heard of Trick or Treat for UNICEF or whatever, but uh, briefly, what is the mission of UN Children's Fund, UNICEF? Well, U UNICEF works all around the world. It works in about 190 countries, um, and we work on the, the promotion of children's rights everywhere and in everything we do. Um, we work on aspects of children's health. We work on uh, making sure that children can go to school. We work on uh, uh, diseases such as HIV and making sure that the right protection systems are in place so that children uh, aren't, don't have to face violence and abuse. Um, and we work on children's nutrition, um, making sure that they have adequate uh, nutrition, food, um, in, in pretty much all of these countries. And so uh, UNICEF is really, it's a global organization and uh, it's really about making sure that the rights as specified in the Convention on the Rights of the Child are, are fully realized. Mm -hmm. Now, our viewers can go to www.unicef.org mm -hmm. and get more information about a myriad of programs and activities that are mm -hmm. underway through this United Nations agency. Let's talk about air pollution. We all breathe the air. We have a vested interest in it. How severe is air contamination, air pollution? Well, it's really, I mean, it's really quite bad. And, and that's what this report uh, looked at. We, we took maps of, uh, uh, maps pr produced by scientists at uh, NASA and Dalhousie and, 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 and uh, several different places that look at how uh, air pollution, how bad it is around the world. And what we did was then we looked at the numbers of children that lived in those areas that were, that were particularly affected. Um, we found that uh, across the world, two billion children live in areas that uh, exceed uh, the limits, the WHO limits for what is considered uh, safe, or at least what is considered their, their, their uh, uh, proven harmful effects above this limit. And we find that two billion kids uh, live in those areas. But what we also did was look at, um, and by the way, that two billion also uh, represents the vast majority of children around the world. Mm -hmm. um, that there are between 2.2 and 2.3 children, a billion children globally, uh, and out of those 2 billion live in areas that exceed the limits. And that's out of a population of 7.6 billion, so that's bumping up to almost half. <laughs> it's getting close. Right, <laughs> right, it's, it's, it's considerable, it, it really it is. It certainly is. Um, and what we did though, we, you know, we didn't want to just look at the number of children that you know, one level of analysis looked at the number of children that lived in areas that exceeded the, the, the limits. But we also looked at um, how many children were exposed to uh, air pollution that was particularly bad. And we found that um, about 300 million kids lived in areas that were six times or more those limits. Um, so, so essentially the, the most toxic air uh, the uh, about 300 million children uh, live in and are exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis. And that doesn't even account for the, the, the other types of exposures that they face in terms of, uh, you know, indoor air pollution is another phenomenon. We're just, this is just outdoor air pollution. Um, and so the risks to children are really quite big. And um, I think we were surprised at how bad it was and we were surprised with these findings, but they really show us that you know this is an issue that has to be 
address. Mm -hmm. Now, you were talking about exterior air pollution, out mm -hmm. outdoor air, and then you mentioned indoor air. Did you look at uh, some of the causes for both? I'm sure you did for both. Interior would it be things like uh, kitchens, uh, smoke pots, things, it's people smoking. Yeah. There, there's yeah, air pollution yeah, yeah. right yeah. there. That's that a form of creates cancer pollution for sure. Not only the smoker, but the people who are in the same house in many yeah. cases. So did you look at all of those particular causes? Yes, we did. We look, we look, <coughs> we, we, um, indoor air pollution is, is caused um, uh, from a multitude of factors, as you're saying, and smoking is definitely one of them. And we know all too well now uh, how bad smoking can be, and even secondhand smoke can be to, mm -hmm. to uh, anyone's health, uh, including children's, and especially young children's health, even pregnant mothers. Um, so, uh, but other types of indoor air pollution include uh, the burning of uh, solid fuels for mm -hmm. cooking in kitchens, um, and we find uh, high levels of use of solid fuels in cooking and heating, and particularly in uh, Africa and across parts of Asia. And this type of pollutant it p is is bad because it can be in such condensed forms. And when a child is in a kitchen or a home where solid fuels are being used and there isn't appropriate ventilation to get that out, uh, they're particularly exposed. And also, um, it tends to be a lot of the poorest mm -hmm. families that use, that, that use more solid fuels for cooking and heating, uh, unlike uh, natural gas or LPG. So, um, uh, it really is something that the poorest children tend to be very vulnerable to. Um, poor, uh, children are also frequently involved in, in aspects of cooking, particularly young girls uh, in a lot of parts of the world. And so their exposure levels are sometimes even especially high as well. Um, so we really find that air pollution, it, it impacts the poorest uh, uh, children often the most, um, whether that is also outdoor air pollution or indoor air pollution. The outdoor air pollution, if you look at the uh, burden of mortality, the number of children who, mm -hmm. um, who die from uh, diseases linked to outdoor air pollution, we find that about 90% uh, of that mortality burden is in low and middle income countries. Mm -hmm. And for the burden of mortality for indoor air pollution, it's about 99% is in low and middle income countries. That's staggering. So that is staggering. Yeah. And there was an article I read the other day that listed the major cities of the world, the mega megalopolises, the megatropolises, mm -hmm. yeah. if you will, or mega cities. And I think Delhi was the most polluted of the cities, and it went down the list. Beijing, Xi'an, China were in that lineup. Mm -hmm. uh, the first I think in the United States, the first city was New York, and it was down about 13th or 15th or something. Mm -hmm. Which areas of the world are having the worst problems with this type of air pollution? Um, well, the, the outdoor air pollution in particular is, is a problem throughout a lot of Asia. Um, and also uh, parts of Northern Africa tend to be quite bad. Um, the uh, pollution recordings vary by time uh, um, and even when the when those readings are taking place. So different cities can top the charts in different ways. But one thing we're also seeing um, is is that some of the most polluted places in the world are not always the megacities. They mm, can really? often be, uh, and I think we're seeing an increasing trend of that. They're often the uh, slightly smaller, still big cities, but on the outskirts, and they're industrial centers uh, on the outskirts of some of these major cities where uh, air pollution is really spiking. Um, some of the biggest cities uh, where air pollution is definitely a problem, like Delhi and also other parts, uh, Beijing has long been known to have certain types of problem uh, with air pollution, but they are also, some, some of them are showing quite positive trends in terms of getting better. So we're seeing some of the megacities actually improve improving. over time. Very good. Um, and, uh, but what I find uh, especially worrying is some of the smaller cities that don't get the same level of recognition uh, and aren't on this focus, uh, mm -hmm. but are also at, at very high risk. Mm -hmm. And sure. you mentioned the negative impacts or the negative effects on children and adults, really, too, to a large degree. But as, as I recall, I think in China, or in the northern part of China, a couple of years ago, they did a study and showed that this one city, I can't remember what it was, you may remember, but the people who lived there, the, the area was so bad that it reduced their 
longevity by five years. It took mm. five years mm. off of their lives. How, how, uh, what can we do to reverse this? What, you, you come up with some practical suggestions on what we can do. How can we short circuit this problem as, as the population gets bigger and bigger, as people use more and more really carbon-based fuels, that mm. type of thing, which are pollutants. Mm. They're causing a large part of the problem. How can we uh, mobilize some ideas and techniques and tactics to try to reduce this air pollution problem? I mean, the, uh, the a big <coughs> one is, is, is exactly what you were saying, which is a reduction in fossil fuel emissions. Um, and actions that reduce fossil fuel emissions um, are really key for, s for so many reasons. Um, it's not only uh, one of the best things we can do to, to combat greenhouse gases and uh, the risks associated with climate change, um, but actions that reduce fossil fuel emissions go a long way to uh, improving the air that we and children breathe. They go, they go a long way to improving children's health now. Um, and so much of the of, of talk around fossil fuel emissions is about the long term, and those are the, the risks there are tremendous. Uh, but um, some of the main benefits we can see really right mm -hmm. now if we, if we if we take actions things that things other things you mentioned specifics um, things like uh, uh, better public transport in cities uh, safer public transport um, there are uh, all sorts of green energy um, and, and alternative energy solutions um, in terms of how we consume mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, heat homes. Um, these are all types of solutions that, that, that could go a long way to reducing even the types of pollutants that, that affect children's health. Mm -hmm. It certainly is, and we have to start looking at this and looking at it seriously. We can see certain industries are fading away. The coal industry is fading very quickly. Uh, oil and natural gas are still there, but there are cer certain things that we can do, and we certainly need to focus on them. Mm -hmm. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous shows. Also, if you are involved with any type of media outlet, be it a PBS station or a community access television station, or perhaps it's an educational institution with an intra-campus television ho uh, hookup, or maybe just be a website, and you would like to share the shows with your friends, family, relatives, uh, colleagues, people around the world, please feel free to go to the website and download the programs. Global Connections Television is provided free of charge at no cost as a public service. Today we're taking a look at a very interesting report that was just published called Clear the Air for the Children, and it was produced by Mr. Nick Reese from the United Nations Children's Fund. Nick, we're talking about the, the this the situation, especially with carbon-based fuels, with fossil fuels, and the green technology uh, technologies that are out there. Did you recommend any? Did you recommend doing things like using solar ovens or come up with ideas for using solar plates uh, on the roofs as opposed to uh, burning coal or something like that? I mean, there, there are so many out there, and, and uh, I think that there is a lot of guidance in terms of what will, what will, what will do a lot and what can really help. Um, I think that uh, you know the, the the wealth of knowledge out there on these things is, is vast, and mm -hmm. I think the key thing here is is that there is a lot that can be done, um, and I think it's really up to people's individual choices to 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 look into that and to really try to find ways that um, can reduce the the amount mm -hmm. of energy, or not necessarily the amount of energy, but uh, definitely the the sources. Uh, um, th that type of uh, activity can go a long way to really helping um, not only prevent uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, that, that, Im that can create the worst uh, effects of climate change, but also uh, can go a long way for improving children's health. Mm -hmm. And sure. a second recommendation you had was to increase children's access to health care. What can we do in that area? Yes, well, uh, over half of the uh, uh, deaths associated with air pollution, um, uh, sorry, with pneumonia, mm -hmm. um, are actually linked with air pollution. And so uh, the degree to which children have access to a lot of the treatments also, and specifically that relates to pneumonia. Pneumonia kills 
almost a million children uh, under the age of five a year. And, uh, and almost half of those are linked to air pollution. So um, ac uh, treatment options and health care that can address uh, diseases such as those, uh, health care that Im can improve children's overall health, including nutrition, mm -hmm. um, can uh, really build a child's resilience mm -hmm. to the impacts of air pollution. Um, the healthier a child is, the more likely they're able to survive the negative effects of, of air pollution. And so really uh, providing that, that coverage is, is, is key. Mm -hmm. Now what can be done to minimize a child or children's exposure to air pollution? There, are there things we can do? Yes, um, I mean I think uh, a lot goes down to things like uh, better urban planning, making sure that polluting sources uh, are not located near where children live, mm -hmm. go to school, where they play. Um, that can go a, a long way. Um, one thing I often see are, you know, uh, 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 burning of waste, and that can happen uh, even in many parts of the world on the street. And sometimes the things that are burned are plastics, mm -hmm. um, even electronics. That are toxic. Highly toxic. And right next to that, children are playing mm -hmm. soccer or, or they're on their way to school. Um, uh, my colleagues have, have met children um, in, uh, in, in, in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, Mongolia who literally have trouble uh, in, in winter in Ulaanbaatar. The, the air pollution can be especially bad because of the use of solid fuels to keep homes warm. In, in the city, and the city is located in, in, in a way that the, the, the air pollution kind of, it, it's harder for the air to escape. Um, children have difficulty going to school um, because the levels of air pollution are, are so bad. So I think that, uh, yes, there's a lot that can be done to uh, improve, to mm -hmm. keep children and to keep air pollution away from children. Um, one key thing is the uh, also better monitoring. Um, we have mm -hmm. to uh, have a better understanding of how air pollution fluctuates on a day-to-day -day basis. And we even saw in Delhi, uh, you know, after major celebrations, uh, use of fireworks and things, it goes, it goes up quite a lot. Um, so it can change on a day-to-day -day basis. And so the degree to which families know how bad the air is outside uh, before they go to work, before children go to school, they can do things to prevent the degree of exposure uh, uh, that they might otherwise face. Mm -hmm. And of course our viewers can go to the website www.unicef.org and get much more information on this. There's also, we've been talking for years now, and the UN has led the way to a large degree on this whole issue of climate change. Uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon at the United Nations has spearheaded the effort to a large degree, not by, solely by himself, but other people and groups are involved too. We see that the UN has held several conferences in Paris of 2000, 2015. In December, they had a major agreement on how to combat climate change. It's pretty much, uh, the, the debate is over, pretty much. 97% of the climate scientists believe climate change is occurring. Mm -hmm. question is how rapidly is it occur occurring and how detrimental will the effects be? Those are the things that are being debated, mm -hmm. not that it's happening. What, how does this tie into that and what can we do to learn more about climate change and what we can do to help combat it. Yeah, well, um, as I was saying, the, the, the actions to reduce fossil fuel emissions, um, uh, whether they include, you know, uh, cleaner energy or, or taking public transport or um, uh, reductions in emissions uh, from polluting factories and things like that, mm -hmm. those uh, actions will, will can go a long way to reducing the greenhouse gases. Um, but they also prevent some of the harmful types of pollution that can affect children's health. And so I think that really kind of uh, drilling home that this isn't just a long-term problem, this is also something that, that we will, s action now can, can actually have immediate benefits. Um, children, uh, we, produ we produced a, pr a report uh, last year in 2015 on the impacts of climate change on children and we found that around half a, a billion kids around the world mm -hmm. live in areas that were uh, uh, of, of extremely high um, flood occurrence. 
So, uh, and we found that about 160 million children live in areas of high or extremely high drought uh, severity. And so these children are at particular risks of further exacerbating uh, effects of climate change. Mm -hmm. They're already in living in some of the uh, conditions where they're at high risk. Uh, climate change stands to exacerbate those risks and and I think uh, the threat, the risks to them are very considerable. So there's so much that can be done here and there's mm -hmm. so much that uh, that the co-benefits of actions to improve air pollution as well as reductions in greenhouse gases that can make a, lot a difference for children's lives now and, and generations and generations to come. It certainly can and it's a ticking time bomb. We do not have a lot of time yeah. to move forward on this and we have to move forward very quickly. As you look forward, talk about forward, mm -hmm. <laughs> as you look forward based on your studies, your previous reports, what do you see as the major challenge in trying to get people to focus more on this particular problem? And follow up, are you looking at another report on some other particular aspect of air pollution or some other climatic condition that uh, plays into this whole equation? Right. I think the one, the one of the key things is really knowledge. And it's just, it's just awareness about the impacts of these, of these types mm -hmm. of things. It's awareness um, that uh, children are particularly vulnerable. Um, their bodies, their lungs, their brains are developing and growing, uh, especially at the very young age, at such a rate where exposure to the harmful toxic chemicals can have lifelong implications. Um, it's knowledge of how bad air pollution is and what the effects are. Uh, oftentimes, in, in particular for pneumonia, children can, can get treated um, but then they return back to the same conditions, that, uh, maybe the same uh, home where solid fuel is used in cooking and heating mm -hmm. that can just mm -hmm. create a reoccurrence of, of um, the disease. And so it's knowledge that air pollution is not harmless. It's not just a bit of dust in the air or it's not just a bit of smoke. Uh, it's, it's understanding how these are linked with uh, diseases mm -hmm. that kill. It's a continuing spiral. <laughs> it's yeah. a continuous cycle. The last minute or so we have, uh, think back, you mentioned earlier the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which came online in 89, was adopted, ratified in 1990. As I recall, I haven't looked lately, every country in the world signed on to it except the United States and Somalia. I'm not sure if Somalia has finally ratified it or not, but it, what, how does the Convention on the Rights of the Child tie into this particular problem and how can we use the Convention on the Rights of the Child to maybe accentuate this problem and a need for immediate action? That's a, that's a, that's a good question and I think that it's, it's a pertinent one because the Convention on the Rights of the Child um, singles out aspects of children's health. Uh, air pollution um, is a, is a re has a real impact on children's health. And so arguably, uh, if we're going to do anything to improve children's health and, and uphold our obligations to, as per the Convention on the Rights mm -hmm. of the Child, we have to do the things that, that present some of the greatest risks to children's health. And so um, bringing environmental concerns, the links between the environment and, and health uh, in particular, but it also affects everything. It affects children's uh, ability to go to school. It affects all, all those other, these, these can't be easily separated. But bringing these environmental considerations into the debates on health and how to improve children's health, I think, is key. Recent WHO reports have pointed to an overwhelming percentage, I think something like a quarter of the percentage of deaths, deaths are linked <laughs> to uh, environmental considerations. And so it's really about bringing these two things, environment and health, together to address things even in the Convention on the Rights of the and Child. And they are both intertwined and we need to focus on them. But Nick Reese, who just authored this Clear the Air for Children study, which is extremely important, very timely. It's a very interesting topic, and it's one that we everyone needs to read it, and they can go to unicef.org to find it. But I want to thank you so much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.